I know we've all been behind Sunday drivers. I know we have. Well, how would you like to be behind this Sunday driver? One Sunday afternoon, there's a state police officer who's sitting out there, and he sees a car going 22 miles an hour. Obviously, that is an issue. So he turns on his lights and he pulls the driver over. Upon getting a, out of his car and approaching it, he notices that there are five elderly ladies who are in the car. And upon closer inspection, he notices that four of them really are pretty. I mean, there you are, as pale, as white as can be. Pale as can be. And wide-eyed. The driver who was obviously confused because did not know what was going on, said, Officer, well, I, I don't understand. I, I was going the speed limit. I always go the speed limit. So what, what was wrong? The officer says, Ma'am, you weren't speeding. But you should know that driving significantly slower than the speed limit can also be a danger to other drivers. So... You were going a little too slow. Slower than the speed limit, she said. No, sir, I was doing the speed limit exactly, and just as the sign said, 22 miles an hour. The officer then uh, shook his head and said to her, says, ma'am, I hope you know that the 22 on the sign is the route number. You're on route 22. If that's not the speed limit, Oh, she nodded her head, she looked a little embarrassed. Thank you for her. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I got a little embarrassed, but she thanked the officer. She made a mistake. But before I let you go, ma'am, she says, I gotta ask these other ladies, are you all okay? I mean, you kind of look a little shaky. You all right? They didn't say anything. The driver then said, Oh, don't worry about him, young man. You know, it's not a big deal. They'll be okay. They just, we just got off of Route 119. Yes. 119. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Some of those curves must have been pretty fun going on 119. But anyway, you know, sometimes we think we know better. We think we understand. Oh, there's a 22. I go up 22 miles an hour. Oh, there's a 443. Uh, I don't think our cars can go that fast. But you know... You know, we look at it, or, or anything, you look at those, and we sometimes we think we know, but in reality, we actually don't. And since we know that we can be wrong, and we know that men, actually more times than not, we're going to be wrong, we must turn to God and His Word to know what is good and what is wise. Not to ourselves, not to committees, but to God, what is good and what is wise. So, we're going to do that as a church, we're going to help evaluate what is going on, and so forth ourselves, some letters to the church. And these letters found in Revelation chapter 2, where they begin. And the first one is written to the church in Ephesus. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I'm going to pause right there for a moment to explain a few things. A lot of symbolism in Revelation. These are actually pretty easy to understand. The first off, we have the words that are first given here are from Jesus Christ. Okay, if you actually go back in chapter 1, you'll see that more clearly, and as we go further, you'll see it clearly again. But these words are from the one who is, he is the one who is dead, he is the one who holds the keys of hate, he is the one who is risen again, he is Christ, okay? So what we find here are some, first off, we find lampstands. The lampstands are the churches, okay? There's seven of them, there's seven churches. Now, the seven stars he holds in his right hand, that those stars represent the leaders of the seven churches. Okay, they're the leaders. But you notice that he holds them again in his right hand. In the right hand, meaning that, he is the, that these leaders serve him, not someone else. They serve Christ. Okay, that Christ is the chief shepherd, if you will. They're like the under-shepherds. Okay? Uh, they serve the Lord because he is the head. And walking among the lampstands symbolizes his authority to be able to, that he is the head. He has authority to be able to inspect them, to evaluate them, and to speak to them. 
and to those congregations. And so I believe that's what he is doing. And I believe that this doesn't represent a specific number. This actually, I believe, refers to, if in a way, to all kinds of congregations. And a congregation can be like an Ephesus or it could be like Smyrna later, depending on what is going on in that congregation. And I believe it's the same thing here, that aspects of these can apply to you, or you may be specifically, that's us. So we can learn from this. So what we find here is in verse 2, that I know your deeds, he says. Your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. we got some traits of faithfulness here. This is a good section. This is a, a very complimentary section that, that the Lord Jesus, that head of the church, is giving to the church at Ephesus. And he's talking about endurance. This church has endured. They have persevered. He's encouraging them to continue to do this. Now, what I'm getting at here, or I think believe he's getting at, is that he does not mention all of the, like, well, you saved X number of people. Oh, you baptized this number. Oh, you did this. Now you, man, you've done a great job. Bravo, bravo. He's not doing that. He says, I see, I know your deeds. I know your hard work, your perseverance. He, he sees the hard work that, we, that they have done. You know, sometimes in ministry, your ministry effort that you put forth, you have great goals, you have great vision and plan, and you just don't see any real visible, <coughs> excuse me, you don't see any real visible success. It seems like it's just, man, we did all that, but what came out of it? Physically, there's nothing. I mean, did your offerings increase? Did your attendance increase? Did your small groups increase? Did the number of kids in your youth ministry increase? You know, so baptism increased. And you're like, you know what, at the moment, no. And the temptation could be to, oh, I'll well, stop. But no, no. You notice the Lord is not, he's, he's not looking at, well, if you have to do X number of, of new people per year, X number of baptisms and salvations, that means that's what you're being successful. No, actually what he does is he says here that, he is pleased. You see that he is pleased. He knows our deeds. He is pleased by the faithful work that is done in his name. In other words, don't give up. Keep on working. He knows what you're doing. Keep doing it. Keep enduring. Keep persevering. Endurance, perseverance is a, is a great trait of a faithful congregation. You don't stop just because you may not see what you want to see physically. You continue moving forward, and you continue ministering in His name. Another trait we see here and find is that the church, a faithful church, does not tolerate false teachers. False teachers lie. They deliberately lie because they are children of the devil. They are, and their lies are their native language. Luke chapter um, nine, verse forty, uh, chapter eight, I believe. It's actually, it's John chapter 8, verse 43, is where Jesus talks about the different children, the children of the devil and the children of God. Children of the devil, they, they, they can't help it. They, they speak. And they speak lies because that's what, that's what Satan does. That's his native language, and their native language is lies as well. As false teachers, that's what they will do. They come in trying to deceive and lie purposely. Anyone who teaches, who preaches, or simply shares something about God, about Jesus, about salvation, should be, anything that they say, whatever it is, should be confirmed by Scripture. Not by some doctrinal statement, not by some expert or something, should be confirmed by Scripture. Everything should be based in the very Word of God. Yes, the Word of God, the Scripture that we have, well, wasn't that written by men? Well, it was written down by men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it, was, it came from God, but it was given through men to be written down. It's been preserved to the, by the Holy Spirit over these years as it's been translated. It is God's Word. And if any teaching does not pass the test, it is not confirmed in Scripture, then that teaching should be removed. It should be gotten away with. 
it's not, it should be basically ignored. Okay? We're talking about core essence of who we are as believers. Obviously about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about salvation, about forgiveness. I mean, there's some really central core things here. Okay? We can, you can have disputes over the colors of the carpets and, and whether you should have pews or chairs and things like that. I don't think you're going to find that in Scripture a whole lot. Okay? Or even today, whether to mask or not mask. I mean, you can have those debates and so forth, and those are fine. You can agree to disagree on those, but you can't agree to disagree about who Jesus is. You can't agree to disagree about whether you're a sinner or not. You can't agree to disagree whether you think that God is the creator or he's not the creator and so forth. No, the scripture is very clear on, about who, on the qualities and who they are and who he is and so forth. So we need to make sure that any kind of teaching that comes out that is about God, about Jesus, about salvation, about, whether, about, about humanity and so forth, about the Holy Spirit, and, and make sure that it's confirmed in Scripture. Verse 4, he says. So in, that, in other words, before we get there, this church has got some good things going for them. They got endurance, and they're not tolerating false teaching. They got some really good things. They test the teaching. There's very good things going on here. They don't give up. That's good. But, and there's verse 4. It says, yet I hold this against you. Okay, time for the not so good stuff. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you first did. Or did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. This is a trait of, faith, of unfaithfulness. A trait of unfaithfulness. Abandoning your first love. That's supposed to be Christ. It's supposed to be God. That you, you love Him. It's your first love. You fell in love with Him. And you should continue to doing that. Just think about when you first fell in love with the, the love of your life. And I know a number of you are going to be widows or widowers. I understand that. Some of you are not married yet. <laughs> You're like thinking, ooh, boy, I hope. And then some of you, maybe things didn't work out so good because of the the evil in our world, I understand. But think about it, when you first fell in love, you first fell in love, I'm not talking about the little puppy love in elementary, middle school, or high school, so I'm talking about that you fell in love with the love of your life, the one who you said, I'm going to spend my life with, at least at that time you felt. Think about all the words that you did, the thoughts that you had, the activities, the spare time that you may have had, the, the, and even a little extra money to find, you basically would use them to spend time and be together or it was focused upon that person. You could have, you go for a walk, you would think about him, you'd talk about him and so forth, or her, or however the case is. I mean, it's, it's like what you would do. It's like your world revolved around this person and the relationship that you could have. Husbands, I could speak from this angle that you... Uh, might have been a thing where you opened the doors for your wife, always. And even your car door, you perhaps even opened for her before she got out or helped her in. You would never belt or pass gas at the table. I mean, everything was good. You even offered to not only cook, but also to do the dishes. Oh, man, when you first got married, you were the just the absolute perfect husband. Everything was done for your wife. Well, fast forward 10 years, or maybe 15 years, maybe 20, maybe 5, depending on the person. Suddenly now you got that antique car you've always dreamed of. Or maybe you're climbing the corporate ladder. Things are going well, but it requires longer hours, more travel. Or maybe there's a sports obsession with your, because of your kids. Or maybe it's because of your, you're involved with the guys hanging out or being involved in some of these you know, betting these sports leagues and stuff like you, fantasy leagues, who knows? Or maybe it's just some other project or hobby or something that you've been, you're in, and it takes up all of your extra time. It takes up your thoughts. When you're thinking, you're, you're looking things up on the internet for ideas on how to do something or ideas how to fix this or how to improve it. Or you're on the phone keeping track of the different fantasy. It's, hey, what are we doing? When are we getting together? And so forth. It consumes your thoughts. It, it, it just... It does all of this, and, and, and your extra money and time, and what happens is the first love, who used to be your wife, has now been replaced by something else. All the extra devotion and time and commitment and everything, energy, goes towards fulfilling, dedicated to this. And 
your wife. Not that you don't love your wife anymore, it's just she doesn't get the extra anymore. It's like she's been replaced. The first love has been replaced by something else. When this happens, it is dangerous to a marriage. Just as it is to a congregation. You see, for a congregation, much of the, the energy and the attention, the finances and planning, instead of going to something that, that God has told us to do, like, for example, making disciples, to helping to save lives, instead what happens is it goes towards something else, which may be put under the guise of, oh, this is going to further our mission. But what happens is the focus gets put upon not the mission, but the method of getting to fulfill that mission. In other words, maybe getting bigger. We want to grow. This is, we, this is how big we want to get to go. That's our goal. So we do everything to get to that point. Or maybe it's a building project. Yeah, this is the project. This is what we're going to do. And it consumes all the time, all the focus, and all the energy. Or maybe even just raising money to stay alive so you don't have to close the door. got to be wary of distractions that take away from the mission of saving lives. Distractions that come in the way and kind of blind you and become your devotion, become your focus, become your, your love that replaces your first love in Christ. And when we become aware of this, when we become aware that we've been distracted, I mean, obviously as individuals, but he is talking as a body here, as a church. When we, as a congregation, as a body of believers, when we become aware of something that we've been doing that has brought us off of the focus upon God's mission of reconciliation, of helping people to become saved through faith in Jesus Christ, something has come in the way. We need to repent of that. We have lost our first love. We must repent God will forgive and he will restore. But there is great danger, great, great danger to not repenting when you're aware of the sin. He's told them, he said, but if you don't repent, in other words, he's telling them that, look, let me read this again to you. He says here, he says, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from his place. In other words, they're now aware of their sin. And if they do not repent of it, they refuse to repent of it, he's going to remove their lampstand. And I believe what happens is, is that that congregation dies. It is no more. Sadly, we do find that. We do find that in our culture, even our community. They become so obsessed with one thing that they, they lose the mission. They lose their first love. And they don't turn away from that. They don't turn back. They don't repent. They just stay on the same course. And the door is closed. Verse 6, he says, but you have this in your favor. So <clears throat> they have something big to work on. they got a big area they need to repent and rekindle that first love for Jesus Christ and for working and serving Him. But he does have something in their favor, though, something that he loves. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. <clears throat> yeah, the Nicolaitans. Who were they? Okay. First off, I want to let you know that there was a guy who was actually was with his psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist kept us. He was, you know, the psychiatrist was listening. The guys on the couch, you know, and, and the chair and so forth. And he's like, he's like, man, he says, you know, Doc, I, I, I get this dream almost every night. This nightmare I've been getting every night. It's more and more vivid each time, and I see more detail every single time. It just started off as I was in this room, and there's this door, and I'm trying to get out. I couldn't get out. I couldn't get out. And, and I just wasn't sure, but I said, but now I know that I'm supposed to get out of that door. I mean, it's, it's, it's an emergency. I have to get out. And it's like, it's like if I don't, I'm going to die there. He says, but I'm frantic, I'm frantic, and I'm pushing, and I'm pushing, and I'm, and I'm working. I cannot get that door open. But I know I have to get there. There's a voice that get outside, get out, get out. And I can't, I can't get out, I can't do it. And there's, and there's just, it's like the sign is mocking me and everything. And I'm just looking at the things and all, there's no way out. There's no windows, nothing. It's, it's just, I don't, I don't know what's going on. 
psychiatrist and he was just, hmm, interesting. He said, tell me, um, can you read the song? Well, he said, I couldn't at first, but I can now, and yes, I know what the song is. He said, well, the psychiatrist said, please tell me. Well, it tells me, it just says, pull. Okay. So the sign says pull, and he's been pushing on the door the whole time. Okay, so in other words, it's kind of like God says to us, pull. The Nicolaitans were pushing. That's all they're doing, is they're pushing. They're doing the opposite of what the Lord is teaching us. That they are not supposed to be living their lives of unrestrained indulgence. That was actually the description that is given by Irenaeus in one of the early um, church fathers, if you will. It's one of the things, again, they lived lives of unrestrained indulgence. They took the paganism of the world, the, the immorality of the world, and they were embracing it because of this completely unrestrained doctrine, if you will, of them about Christian liberty. I have the freedom to do anything in Christ. But Peter writes to us, reminding us through the Holy Spirit, that do not use your freedom as a cover for sin. We are not supposed to sin because, oh, I got, if I'm free, I can be forgiven. And the Galatians were carrying this way too far. God says, pull, and the Galatians were saying, push. And it wasn't working. And so what we have here is a church that is saying that, no, I know that is wrong because they knew that you should pull. <laughs> In other words, children of God obey God's leading, teaching, and commands, and so forth. They, they obey them because we know they're wise and good. This is another trait of faithfulness. We will do what God asks. In other words, he put the sign on the door that says, pull, we're going to pull. We're not going to push to do it our own way. Jeremiah 44, 4, we find that actually, and, and you can find it in some other places too, God hates impurity. God hates sin. He hates evil. And we should hate it too. So if someone is engaging in immorality, we, we don't join them in their immorality to try to reach them. We love the person. We don't condone the sin. Because we hate the evil. Verse 7, he concludes in this letter here, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He's talking about, obviously, that you know, we overcome. We can overcome because Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And we do it through our faith in him. But I just want to touch on something here really at the end. If you're feeling tired of serving, in other words, you feel like you've been doing this for years. I'm, I'm just tired. If you feel like you're getting worn down in the spiritual struggle, particularly through during this time period too, where there is an increased spiritual struggle that's going on between the freedom that we can have in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit moving and, and the tyranny that the enemy is trying to bring through his lies and deceits and obviously the demons that are working, but also so many people who have joined him, his children. You get the children of God and children of the devil, children of light, children of darkness. And if you feel that you're getting worn down in the spiritual struggle, you're getting tired of serving, kind of, it's just like, oh, I don't know, I, I just, I just want to sit back, I just want to relax, I want to stop. You've got to remember 2 Corinthians chapter 12. His grace is sufficient. Paul writes through his struggle. His grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in our weakness. Yeah. In other words, I am not to be ministering in my own strength. Sometimes we try that. When we do, we get worn down. And that's also what we do in ours. We get worn down. That's when we begin to kind of compromise. And that's how the Nicolaitans probably began to bring in the stuff of the world because, oh, that's not a big deal. Hey, well, that's okay. It's not a big deal. And you start doing that because it's going to make it easier instead of standing firm in the truth of Christ as you reject the false teaching because you evaluate, test everything. It kind of well, it gets kind of weary and tiring. But His grace is sufficient and His power is made perfect in our weakness. Therefore, we endure and we don't give up. Because He is our strength. We reject false teaching because He's given us His Word. The Lord is our first love because He loved us first. 
so that we could be saved and become his child. We obey all of God's teaching because it is wise and good to do so. It benefits others and it brings glory and honor to our Father who is in heaven. We now, we can be faithful. We need to listen to the head of the church, of what he's looking for in faithfulness, and what we need to fix and repent when we're unfaithful. He is the head. We belong to him. Let's listen to what he's saying to us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. My Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you've given us your Son, you've given us the Holy Spirit to guide and to lead and to speak to us as a, as a church body, as a congregation. I pray that we will listen to your voice, that we would be faithful by enduring and not giving up, by rejecting false teaching based in, in using your word as a basis for the test that you would always be our first love. That we would repent if we turn away and become unfaithful from, to you, that we would repent of that. I know that you would forgive. And that we would obey all of your teaching. If you tell us to pull, we will pull. If you tell us to push, we will push. I pray, Father, that we would be increasing and our faithfulness to you, doing everything in your name and doing it by your grace and through your power. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.